full four-year degrees uh, are coming back uh, nearly fluent, if not completely fluent, and I think that's going to have an impact. It's going to further enhance Korea's competitiveness economically. Uh, but uh, I think it also, I think it's going to have a healthy effect on attitudes toward the United States. I certainly found this when I was in Russia with those much smaller numbers of students who had a chance to spend a year or six months in the States living with an American family. I had this sense of the scales falling from their eyes. You know, I had all these wrong ideas and prejudices about America. Well, Koreans are better informed, perhaps, than somebody out in Novosibirsk. Uh, I think inevitably uh, having the chance to to live, study, in a, or even work now under this new West initiative uh, will help uh, promote more positive feelings about the United States that it will offset the, the fact that you know, the younger generation doesn't have any direct experience of the Korean War, doesn't sort of have this understanding of why our alliance came into being in the first place. <coughs> so I can't, you know, I, I don't know if anybody's tried to analyze this quantitatively yet, but I, that's, that's, those are among the effects that I think we're going to begin to see more, more clearly. In terms of uh, getting more exchanges in the other direction, um, Korean, uh, many more Korean universities are beginning to offer uh, graduate programs in English as they try to attract foreign students more generally. And I, uh, I hope that uh, Americans will take advantage of these opportunities. Uh, but the numbers are still very tiny as far as I can see. And so uh, the Korean government may want to think about, uh, as part of its half of this West initiative, the Work English Study tra Travel Initiative, to create more incentives to uh, bring Americans for at least an academic year to a Korean university. Uh, clearly, learning Korean is a very formidable obstacle, as I discovered myself. I mean, you really need two full years of nonstop language study to become even modestly proficient. So most people are not going to put in that kind of time unless they want to do Korean studies. But uh, Korea has great universities. And if you can study in English and maybe get a little flavor of Korea on the side, uh, more Americans will do that. My name is Peter Wan Han, journalist from South Korean newspaper, Don't Lie Evil. Um, I want to add uh, my appreciation to your service, one of the services I've paid to. And please uh, uh, pardon my civic uh, questions. Um, when I was covering the uh, 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 Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade in South Korea, journalists has always these questions. Um, the two biggest stars in U.S. Uh, diplomatic corps, you and uh, Mr. Hill. What was the relation between you two? <laughs> uh, you were kind of um, team of rivals, like uh, uh, Obama, Obama is trying to make, or what kind of relation was that odd, or was it kind of full harmony, good relations? <laughs> Sorry, I think overall we had, we had good relations. Uh, Certainly, uh, we had worked together in other, uh, other roles in previous years, particularly during the Balkan crises of the 1990s. And uh, while I was at the NSC, and he was at State, so there was always a certain bureaucratic rivalry. We were generally on the same wavelength on the substance of the issues, and that was certainly true uh, when it came to Korean issues as well. Uh, yeah, there, there might be you know, times when, uh, because of bureaucratic fights in Washington, Chris Hill had, uh, Chris Hill was, if this is still the case, required to keep some of his cards close to the vest, but uh, usually uh, the embassy was uh, clued in to his, uh, his strategy and what he was trying to achieve so that we could more effectively represent that view uh, in our contacts with, uh, with the Koreans, both the government and the public. And so... Uh, you know, I think that we work pretty well together. And I think because he was so, uh, and remained so focused on the six party talks, uh, I think he looked to the embassy for uh, advice and leadership on most of the other issues, the FTA, the alliance. And so we had a good division of labor in that respect. Okay. I think we have time for one final question here. 
Thank you, Mr. Chibong with Radio Feature. I think this is the hard question on relationship between you and us. And as you did, uh, it's been reported that you, you've been somewhat uh, criticizing or unhappy about PCK's initiative by six party process. But how would you predict, project the current situation of six party process? And my second question is you've been emphasizing the importance of U.S. and South ROK relationship, but unfortunately, whenever the U.S. I mean, Seoul has come to more closer to Washington, the relationship between Pyongyang and Seoul has been pretty awkward. Then, in, in your opinion, how could South Korean government deal with those issues to strengthen the relate, uh, alliance with the United States and at the same time uh, not losing the uh, inter-South Korean uh, relationship? Well, on your first question, uh, you know, I think that uh, in my three years, uh, there were never any real <coughs> serious disagreements on on policy towards the six-party talks. The embassy would often offer its tactical advice and suggestions, and sometimes those ideas were were accepted, and sometimes they weren't. That's uh, that's normal. But uh, in terms of the overall goal of a negotiated solution, uh, we were very much on the same page. Uh, in terms of the prospects, you know, we'll see uh, what happens on Monday, but uh, just reading some of the m comments from Kim ye that I've seen just briefly uh, on my way over here, um, I'm cautiously optimistic that uh, we will find a, a good solution on this verification protocol. And uh, as I said, uh, hand off a uh, functioning six-party process to the next administration. It's, a, it's still a very, it's, it was always going to be a steep climb from phase two to phase three, and uh, that remains the case, but better to have the process, I think, still alive and, and kicking than uh, to have it uh, in disarray. Uh, on the second part of your question, I think part of the answer is, of course, for the U.S. to do its part to try to uh, Convince the North Koreans that this sort of Tongli uh, Bangnam <laughs> approach is uh, is a waste of time, and it's just hurting the North's own interests. Because, uh, as I read President Lee's policies, uh, you know they remain quite forthcoming in terms of a uh, willingness to help the North overcome its economic difficulties, to provide humanitarian aid. Uh, it's not all or nothing. It's not complete denuclearization before you get any aid. It's a step-by-step it's a -step strategy. So uh, hopefully uh, the North will get used to the, the fact that there's a new government in the South sooner rather than later, uh, and we can better harmonize our strategies towards the six-party talks and towards bilateral relations with the North. Uh, uh, since I think we only have so much leverage, to solve problems, uh, we should try to focus all that leverage uh, in as coordinated a way as we can with a view to solving the nuclear issue and helping the North Korean people through uh, North-South engagement. Okay. Well, let me thank uh, you, the participating audience. This has been a, a good set of questions. It has rounded out a good di a discussion, uh, but it is based upon a terrific uh, presentation by Ambassador Versbau. Uh, Sandy, thank you very much for coming, making this presentation, giving us some things to think about, and we wish you and uh, Lisa all the best as uh, you begin the uh, second phase, uh, uh, unrestricted by the bureaucracy. So, congratulations. Thanks a lot. <laughs>